a new episode of the Wine Tech Insiders podcast. We're very excited again to have our insiders. Seb is in the hills of Italy, it looks like, and uh, he is from Trolley. And um, Lori is calling in, I think, from Vancouver, um, from Outshinery. And Nick looks like he might be in France um, from Wine Owners. Um, and this week, we're going to talk about thinking global with your brand. First, we're going to try something. Um, we're just going to cover a few topics that have come up, um, a few news items that have come up um, over the last few weeks, um, and just get our insider's reaction. Um, there was a study of 200,000 wine scores um, from Robert Parker and the Wine Enthusiast that showed that organic wines taste better. What do you guys think about this? Is are organic wines just better? Do they taste better? Is this a red herring? Do you, do you have any idea? Well, I, I, a... Have a, I have a perspective, I think, that if you look at the, the great wines of the world that are being made, all of the effort goes into the vineyard, goes into care of the vine, goes into the sorts of husbandry around the way that the... Um, foot of the vine is trained, the way that the vine is then either allowed to shoot or not shoot and all the rest of it. And, and I think that uh, organic biodynamic actually is, is a reflection and an expression of someone who has a greater emphasis on the vineyard than they do in the cellar and the, the 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 making of the wine. Not that, that isn't important, of course. So so I think I think whether you are lutte raisonné or whether you're organic or biodynamic, actually it's about a mindset towards how you think about, care about, and manage your vines. I think uh, from my perspective. What was interesting? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, from my perspective. Um, I'm very much in line with what Nick is saying. And I think the whole organic and biodynamic are really labels to help the consumer understand what they're buying into uh, far more than just strictly the quality of the product, uh, simply because at its root, making wine uh, is really, as Nick was saying, very much the, the, the best fruit. Let's try and get the best result out of the best fruit with the least number of alteration uh, or man manipulations. Um, and over the course of, of the years, uh, technology is changing and the wine is being manipulated a bit more just to sort of hide little characters that we're not so comfortable with. And the more we kind of do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, oh, we end up being a bit more mass market, mass production. And the wine is basically what I would call a soup uh, that is, is no longer wine. So organic and biodynamic is nothing really new from a wine making perspective but it's a label for consumers to realize actually this uh, wine uh, uh, house, this chateau, this wine producer is really trying to modify and use less chemicals and use less modification on the wine, right? Um, so it's, it's a good help for the consumer. And I think whether it's a better or, or a worse wine, uh, I'd like to say the product is a very subjective outcome. So as a consumer, whatever you're enjoying, should be the best wine. Um, I wouldn't dare say that everything organic is by default better than anything else. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's a good indicator of the crafted nature uh, of the product, right? Um, what was really interesting, Laurie, was um, they were saying that um, they did a study in 2016 um, and they found that one third of California wineries were using organic who, who could get organic or, or had cert organic certificates, we're not even putting them on the label. Mm. That's something that um, Outshannery has been noticing because we are in the business of making, you know, wine bottle images. So we see new labels literally every hour. Uh, and we see more and more like two trends, uh, light wines, right? Like lower calories, lower alcohol. So this is kind of like starting to really pop up. And also like much more like in, um, yeah like biodynamic and organic and much more put front forward even having like 
limited edition label, limited edition design. So I think uh, some wineries have an awareness of that it is important to the consumer and the consumer will react, um, be more prone to purchase and they're more proudly like putting this at the front. Some wineries still put little badges at the back, uh, but we're seeing more and more, like I'm not saying that everyone, but the one that uh, can have this claim, um, they're no longer hiding it, if anything, they're kind of like presenting it in an interesting way at the front and the official logo or a symbol uh, at the back. Mm -hmm. And and formally that, that claim of being organic, uh, we're lucky because the US probably has some pretty stringent rules on what makes you organic. However, that definition of natural, organic, biodynamic changes with every regions on the planet in different countries. So it's not really a reliable um, kind of a piece of information from a winemaking perspective, but as a consumer, it's a good indicator uh, ultimately yeah. that you're buying something a bit more, a bit more, let's say clean. Yeah. yeah. I would imagine that consumers don't realize like the level of differences of like, you know, and, and myself as well, I know like the organic in Chile is different than organic here in British Columbia, but to what degree? I don't know, you know, but like Commoser can do like an organic bottle for a very reasonable price. It's just like, okay, like, you know, like it's just, it's just very interesting. Um, Nick, we are, governments in the world are trying to deal with the uh, COVID crisis and a lot of them are doing now or need to do stimulus package. The UK, we're, we're right in the early March right now. The UK is, is leading the world in vaccinations, really incredible. Um, um, and coming soon out of a lockdown, we think, um, and have just announced a new budget, um, which contains um, a freezing of alcohol duty. What do you, what do you, what have you heard about the budget? Um, you're in the UK, you're operating in the UK with importers um, across the board. Um, um, what, what are you hearing? Well, I mean, the budget is good news. Uh, the backdrop, of course, for the first, for the last couple of months has been Brexit and, and how um, businesses of all types, not just the wine business, has been, have been, have been adapting to and, and, uh, and coping with uh, the new uh, administrative burden that that faces and, and in some cases some fairly significant delays. So... In context of that, the budget is is pretty good news. Um, obviously, we're looking to the hospitality sector opening up properly, I guess, um, in in June, if not earlier. Um, so at least there's a roadmap. It's not tomorrow, but um, there's a clear plan, which you know is we haven't always had a clear plan. So I think that's I think that's extremely good news. Uh, the other aspect of the budget that I think is really quite exciting is that there is a lot of stimulus baked into the budget in respect of support for businesses going forward. Um, not just the standard stuff that we've been seeing around the world, like furlough schemes, but in this case, uh, helping, biz encouraging businesses to invest, to invest in um, how they plan their business growth, but critically also in technology. So um, the outline of the plan was announced. We're not going to hear the details until June, but the good news is that there's going to be a £5,000 check potentially for anybody investing in technology that helps them um, uh, uh, do CRM better, um, deliver better better uh, customer uh, programs and, um, and helps them in respect of those other kind of core cool business activities really. So I'm quite excited about that. Uh, and obviously as a technology provider of business operating systems to the independent um, wine operator market, um, we, are, um, we, are, we are very excited at the prospect of being able to um, help people get over the line in making decisions to invest in technology for the, for, the, for the benefit of their own future, go digital, you know, all the things that we know from the past 12 months are going to be incredibly important um, 
for businesses' uh, growth. And the money's now on the table as a further incentive. And five grand is, you know, not an insignificant amount of money when it might only cost five grand to get up and running with a new business platform and then whatever the monthly recurring fees are. So, so suddenly there's actually, there's actually no entrance fee at all to being able to um, retool your business and make sure that you're set up for, you know, what is going to be digital, you know, growth in digital over the next few years. So I think that is very, very positive. Um, notwithstanding, we're all going to pay for it further down the line. Uh, there's a lot of stimulus short term, and there are going to be a lot of taxes in the medium term. Um, and Seb, there was another headline um, that was quite important from um, this week that I caught um, in the drinks business. Underage shoppers and face masks are fooling staff into selling them booze. Bad <laughs> thing or a great thing? Don't have to answer that. Okay, let's go on to thinking global with your brand. Um, there are many brands out there, whether you're, you have a wine brand or your company brand, and um, we are a global podcast. We're in not just the hill in Italy, but uh, we're all over the world. Um, we're in Europe, we're in North America, um, and we have clients all over the world. Um, and um, we are kind of uniquely um, positioned to talk about um, what this means and what we see from clients who are trying to bring their brand really um, global. What are some of the common, maybe Seb, I'll start with you. I know um, you have a lot to say about about this, what are some of the common success factors um, and themes um, to bringing your brand uh, across the world? Look, I think that there's, uh, there's a number of different angles um, when we look at having a global brand. Um, global could be across, across country lines. Uh, in some geographies, global could be across state lines as well. Um, and ultimately, uh, one aspect that we've been working fairly closely to the wineries using uh, Trolley uh, is really to start recognizing that um, technology not only is helping wineries push across borders, right? So we're able to generate import, export documentation more readily. We're talking about the UK. We're talking about Brexit. We're now capable at a trolley to generate a uh, import document into the UK. The new form that needs to be filled is magically filled for you. So technology is not only helping wineries push out and make their brand a bit more global, but it is also allowing them to record, to actually measure interest in different markets. Right. So most of the wineries Trolley works with, look, we're looking at look at winery well below the 50,000 cases produced. Most wineries are 10 to 15,000 cases and below. And ultimately, they don't have the inventory uh, available. They don't make enough wine, literally, to be able to say, oh, yeah, I'll have a distributor in the US. I'll have a distributor in uh, Europe. I'll have a distributor in Asia and in Canada and different markets. However, now with technology, now everyone is getting a bit more on top of analytics and, and Facebook posts and what works, what doesn't work. They're now starting to see, oh, there's a lot of interest out of a certain market. So then I can work at actually pushing more wine in that market without having to do uh, any sort of research on which market would my wine fit in, right? Uh, so there's definitely the, the pushing of the wine that technology is helping. And there's also the decision of how do we pull wine into a market? Uh, that I think technology is is definitely helping. And Laurie, um, you're helping wineries create amazing imagery. Um, what are key factors that uh, wineries need? What what are what are they talking about? What are some topics for them growing growing globally? So a lot of like wineries come to us to help uh, control and elevate their brand image, uh, ideally on a global level. Uh, it's been fascinating to watch, um, you know, the same bottle of wine, um, you know, can be sold in different markets around the world. And every single time there would be a different picture, more often than not, of really poor quality uh, bottle shot um, of the same exact bottle of wine. So. You know, like it's always a bit of a mystery. It's just like, who took that picture? Like, is it somebody at the back of like the wine store? Is it like the brand? And um, wineries realize that 
um, they have to, you know, push their brand image, like, like present themselves cohesively, constantly, no matter which market they're in. Like you can be selling or have an article about your wine uh, in the UK and have still like you need like to present your brand properly. So uh, they come to us for like bottle shots that look great and like other lifestyle images. And they really, uh, the most um, thorough one of them, like really make sure that they are deployed across all um, the different like channels. Like they used, uh, um, sorry, like a dam, like they share links with uh, the different like journalists or bloggers so that they cohesively represent their brand the same quality way and not let that in the hand of others. Um, so that's something we're really proud of enabling here at our channery. And we're just getting started. Like we're working on integration to make it like easier, smarter, but there's no reason that that same bottle of wine. And a challenge sometimes wineries really, like just Google your own wine and be ready to be amazed by the, the search image result that is most likely really, really poor. Um, so that's, that's just where we come in. Yeah. It's like there's a question of control, brand mm -hmm. control as well that comes behind this. And uh, mm -hmm. there's a very thin, um, thin line between how much do you really want your brand to be global and for anyone to do anything with it versus how much do you want to retain full control over your brand but you don't really want to push too broadly uh, it's a very thin it's a very thin balance to strike i absolutely agree with laurie we're seeing um, localized labels especially i mean into a chinese style market yeah. um, but you definitely want to have a certain amount of oversight mm -hmm. over what labels and what images are being promoted uh, from your brand in different markets mm -hmm. and technology is definitely helping with keeping that amount of control right yeah um, we we have in in trolley we've actually got different connections with different sales platforms and we're capable of helping wineries recognize or identify the sale price of their product in different channels mm -hmm. uh, and we have a bunch of wineries who turn around going oh my distributor is undercutting me. They're selling my wine for cheaper than I'm selling on my own website, right? That <laughs> kind of doesn't quite work. Um, and it's the same also from a, I think we're seeing increasingly, there was a really interesting um, documentary a few years ago. Most, most would have heard of sour grapes uh, and the wine fraud that took place in the U.S., uh, this basically happens on a day-to-day -day basis in, in most, I wouldn't say most Asian markets, but in China for sure. Uh, we have wineries who've had their wines copied, right? Uh, and so ultimately, it's really hard. As you're pushing across boundaries, you are definitely bound to lose a, a level of control. Uh, and that's why I think it becomes really important to choose which markets you want to go into and why. Right? If your website is not available in Chinese, uh, and yet you're getting a lot of visitors from China on your website, which technology will tell you exactly how many are coming from a, a Chinese computer. Um, then you definitely want to have your brand to be represented in Chinese. You know what I mean? I mean, if it's part of your strategy. Um, what about translating, uh, Laurie? Do, do you see that people are, uh, or uh, people, uh, brands are completely tran translating their um, labels creating kind of, or are they trying to stay French or stay American or whatever um, and retaining words and feel from the original? Well, that, that's interesting. So I'm going to take, so I, I used to be, I'm still, I'm a, a designer as well, like beyond like having created out Chinery. So a couple of years ago, I used to live in Norway um, and I was designing Italian labels for the Scandinavian market. And there was really like two strong strategies. Um, there were some, the most um, iconic brands, like, so Italy is really big in Scandinavia, uh, then comes France and then Spain. And some of the most iconic brands, they would stay on purpose, like really, really French, French on the world label, and just at the bank, like the mandatory Scandinavian, you know, like the four languages all crammed together in like a, a stamp size uh, sticker. That being said, like the most uh, innovative and um, less known brand would definitely adapt the whole um, packaging to that particular market. So it's not just a question of like translating like the language. Sometimes they would keep actually the language, you know, um, of reference for like a, a sense of like belonging and origin, uh, but like they would speak and to the Scandinavian market. So um, 
really like the way like the you know Scandinavian design is very particular like it's very minimalistic it's got a bit of a, a dry humor in some instances and they would really like build on that and if you take that exact label and bring it to France it would never sell you know like so that's just like something that's been like very interesting um that way um that I've been seeing um on my end and Nick how does this all differ from you know importers and their brands and, and the fine wine market and um is, is well, what I think Sir Malloy saying sort of hold up or what, what do you think? Um, so sort of picking up on, on one of Seb's themes, um, you know, there is, there is a significant overhead that technology can solve, can solve in terms of managing the purchasing of wine in, in being clear about uh, which party is responsible for what activity under international so inco terms, basically, uh, making sure all the commodity codes are correct for the importation of wine. So, so I think you know it, it's a complicated, um, it's a complicated uh, um, um, sort of map, if you like, on on the distribution and retail side. Um, but technology can make an enormous difference and save a huge amount of admin, and at the same time make it much easier for people to be importing wines from all over the world and being much more confident about when they can add those wines into their inventories, when they can sell them, how quickly therefore they can um, turn their purchases into, into profits. So, so that, I think that's a big thing. Um, and, and obviously the secondary market um, at the fine wine end of the, of, of, of the, uh, of, of the market is, is a thing unto itself and, and something that often I think um, producers don't necessarily always quite understand. They can't quite understand how a wine that they sold five years ago for a certain amount of money is, is, is selling for considerably less than they sold it for in the secondary market, for example. So I think uh, increasingly um, the more savvy producers, of course, are tracking and staying on top of that and figuring out what it means in terms of things like their new release prices. Um, but I think traders in the secondary market have always been pretty global um, and, and, and very much think in terms of the world as their marketplace. And, and, and certainly you know, out of the UK, it's been a global trading hub historically. Hopefully that will remain the case, you know, notwithstanding um, recent changes, but and and is that secondary market? That's that's really in the UK. LiveX. What could you describe that for everybody? Where is that happening? What's what is that secondary market? So the secondary market is um, wines that have already been purchased. They've been typically stored, uh, potentially in many cases stored um, without um, uh, duties and and sales taxes being applied, which makes them far easier um, to be resold into back into a global market. Um, and if you look at the the retail structures, then you have you know many retailers, many merchants who are also undertaking brokerage, who are uh, helping customers to sell their wines back in into that market, and whose whose clients, thanks to platforms like Wine Searcher, um, uh, are global uh, and demand is global. And as, as, as we all know, um, uh, that has in increasingly been the case since, since, since the late noughties. Um, so, um, you know, in many ways, in many ways, I think the global, I think the secondary market is much simpler um, than the primary market, notwithstanding again, some of the new regulations coming out post Brexit threaten that with the VI1 forms that, that are being proposed for the middle of the year, um, but we'll have to see. Can, can I just throw, throw a, little, uh, a little question back at you, Nick? What do you think, in terms of ratio, what do you think is the, the ratio of secondary versus primary market sales globally? Hmm. Are we talking one, two, three, five percent single digit? Are we talking double digits? Yeah, I, so I, th I think secondary market sales globally are somewhere in the region of sort of six to eight billion. Okay, so okay. Fairly, fairly significant, um, but the primary market has to be bigger, right? Yeah, 
I mean, wine globally is, I mean, depending on what you're reading, is it 380 to 400 ish billion uh, mm. USD at retail? Um, so yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's probably a single, definitely single digit, but it's probably a whole lot more um, average dollar value per bottle in the secondary market because there are wines which tend to be solid and matured and kept for, for much longer. Uh, it's, it, I think it's far more f uh, frequent to see bottles selling at a few hundred bucks, a few thousand bucks, uh, if not tens of thousand, as opposed to a twenty twenty five dollar bottle, right? And we know that the yeah, bulk of the market. I think you see activity at either end of the market, to be honest. You see activity of, of you know, bottles for 20 bucks as well. Um, you know, people buy an awful lot of wine and they realize that they are never going to drink right. this stuff. They need to sell it. Yeah. Um, Look, we, we also work with a, a technology um, who's uh, managing seller inventory and, and aging and helping wine uh, collectors or wine sellers or, or buyers to actually recognize their wine is now aging is now peaking and you still have five cases you should consider moving it and selling it um, so i think there's definitely an enormous amount of technology which is helping uh, towards recognizing that you should just you know move it drink it or sell it um, so that it doesn't go bad yeah 100 percent. oh it's a fascinating topic fascinating topic Great. Um, any final thoughts uh, that we didn't get out? I think we, we covered some tips and stuff. Seb, do you have any last minute or? Uh, look, I would, uh, I'd like to just add a quick note on the, um, the copied wines and the brand control. And it's very much my attitude, genuinely speaking. Um, I, I'm, I normally try and encourage wineries to take a tiny bit more risk and be a tiny bit more uncomfortable with the lack of control, as opposed to really trying to lock down, control their brand inside and out, um, simply because there's a lot of energy, a lot of effort in trying to control everything. Um, and all of that energy and effort can be spent somewhere else. Um, so ultimately, <laughs> We all need to be a bit more uncomfortable with what's happening with our brands and just see what the market does with it, right? If yeah. your wine is being copied in China, it means there's a hell of a market for you to push more wine in China. You know what I mean? That's my attitude, generally speaking. And I think the corollary of that uh, in, the, um, in the retail channel is that it is desperate for content. It wants, it needs to be able to tell stories, show images and provide you know, decisive content that are going to help people make buying decisions. And the more you control that content and the more you make it difficult and force people to kind of re-originate the same stuff over and over again and create this ridiculous amount of sort of administrative overhead that's sort of unseen, if you like, but which, yeah. which, is, which is needless. Yeah. And that's exactly like between a like control and like, just busyness exactly i was just like preaching to the choir for me like uh it's just you don't have to control everything when it comes to brand image um but like already coming out there and making available like quality asset and that goes like beyond just having like a uh, you know like oh but here's like one image on the website if you right click on it you can save it and it's great you know like it's just like having like more available quality assets so that that part you control and then you let um, you know, like the, the third party, like journalists or like, you know, retailers, like then take it to the next level. Um, but at least you, 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 you give them a starting point that you are confident is representing your brand correctly versus like letting it out in the wild and having them interpret everything from scratch and making them busy for no reason uh, as well and less chances to even like go there, right? Like it's just what we see time and time again with the wineries we work with, if you provide quality visual content, brand content to the world, quite honestly, like the world will talk yeah. more about you because it's just easier. Yeah. You know, like it's just like the reality of it. Uh, so not only do you exert some kind of control, but you also just get talked to more about and people spend more time on your website and they click through more and they're, you know, like it, it just like ripples from there. Most wineries, in our experience, most wineries don't even have a media page on their website. And so someone who's interested in, in like a blogger who wants to write about a certain wine is going to go on the winery's website and all they get is a pixelated bottle image. 
yeah. So what do they do? They do a Google search. Correct. Find whatever, and then and this is like right there in like you lost your brand, uh, you know, like and it's and it wasn't that hard, like to just like help them, or they may just choose to like you know what I was hesitating between these two wines. This one has it already all cut out for me. I'll talk about this one instead. It's easier. Um, one, one, I know we're, we're running a bit tight on time. One question I had for Laurie is when we're talking about labels being designed towards a specific market, I think China is, it comes, comes to mind. You mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, is this, was it Sweden, the Netherlands? Uh, Norway. Norway. Are there, mm -hmm. are there any other markets that you can think of that would strongly benefit a localized label? I'm just curious. I, I just don't know much about it. Uh, so that okay, you're putting me on the spot and everything. Like, I would be curious um, to see a bit more, like um, you know, like new world wines are uh, coming into uh, more like Europe or something like that. Like each time I go back to France, as you can probably pick up from my accent, I'm originally from France, uh, Burgundy, and I'm still very amazed how it's not that known in France still that you know, the rest of the world makes wine. And when people drink outside of France, like it's very, very exotic. Um, it's changing, don't get me wrong. Uh, but I remember like having an argument with my uncle that says, well, Americans can't have Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is French. I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, like, it's just like, let's just like backtrack a little bit. Oh my God. Um, but, but I would imagine like coming, um, you know, putting aside like the challenges of, you know, selling US wine in France, like import, export, but, um, coming in with like a story that is interesting to say there's so much actually like you know friends versus states and like um that would be just interesting to explore i don't think it's been done a lot um the uniqueness of scandinavia is all these uh countries are first heavy drinkers for the population that's uh, quite well known um but they also uh they only have one state controlled um liquor store, right? So we have the Vin Monopolet for uh, Norway, System Balaget for Sweden. Sorry, I forgot the one for Finland, um, but all of these countries have like one purchaser. So they also command um, literally like sometimes it's a clear direction to the winery, let's say in Italy, it's like we'll take that many amount of cases and it's typically a lot, but you need to make us a label that we'll sell in our market. Like that's a condition to selling in those countries. So I think that's also why um, it's happening a bit more in those markets. I did, just for the last story, I did used to also work in Berlin. Um, so it's German, oversimplifying it, but they love a lot of Spanish wine. And um, there was also an adaptation of Spanish winery labels for the German market. Not a translation, there was no like German winery you know, name or anything like German brand. It was still like Spanish brand, but like very easy to accept, easy to like understand and access um, beyond like, you know, saying just Temple Neo or Yora on it. So just like very, very interesting. Uh, less, I would say less of a difference than the Scandinavian market, but, um, and this was less prone, obviously like German is much more open. You can buy alcohol in like regular retailers and everything. So it was more like from the winery's perspective, like, hey, I believe I can sell more if I adapt slightly my label to make it more appealing to the Germans compared to being commanded from above or highly, highly recommended. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks guys. Um, this was Thinking Global with your brand and our wine tech insiders. Thank you so much, Lori from Mount Shinery, Nick from Wine Owners and Seb from Trolley. We'll see everybody again in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Catch you later. Nice chatting.